If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So we had uh, Mark Mastroff on the show again. And, you know, this guy, he's, he's, uh, he means a lot to, to all three of us. Uh, before I get into that, let me tell you what this guy has achieved. Uh, one of the reasons why this guy is such a badass. Okay, so he created in 24 Hour Fitness. He's the founder of 24 Hour Fitness. He did this in 1983. In 2005, he sold that company for $1.6 billion. Remember, at this time when he sold it, 420 clubs, it was the biggest gym in uh, business in the world, the biggest gym chain. He's a CEO of Fitness Holdings Worldwide currently, and now he's founded Planet Fitness in Russia, Germany's Miss Sporty, NEV Australia. He owns the company that owns UFC gyms and uh, Crunch gyms. He's founded Madonna's Hard Candy gyms. Uh, he also founded NRG Esports in 2015. This is a company that I think is valued at something like how, how much is this company? Well, that valued? space is is worth nine hundred million dollars, and it's supposed to move into this year into the billion dollar space. So he got into esports a few years back, back in two thousand and fifteen, and just what a smart move. I mean, he, I think he talks about it in the the episode too, where I think there's about I think he owns now ten teams mm. uh, that are esport teams. So just a smart guy, man. He sees things way ahead of the average person. So I love picking his brain around stuff like that. One this. of the owners of the Sacramento Kings. Um, I know it, it, online if you look him up, it says his personal worth is valued at over a quarter billion dollars. He is the godfather of the gym industry, and of course he started the company that you know Adam, Justin, and myself all started our fitness careers in. 24 Hour Fitness, and we learned a lot from the people that he trained. He hired, trained, and developed. And so, you know, he's got a special place in our heart, um, but he still it continues to be a major player in the fitness industry, at least the gym part of the fitness industry. He is the one that pioneered a lot of the things that makes that make gyms successful today. Um, and so we talked to him again today. Uh, and on this episode, we talk about, of course, we talk about the gym industry. We talk about uh, esports. We talk about the NBA and his role as the owner of the Sacramento Kings. If you work in fitness, you want to listen to Mark Mastroff. The Shit, guy is if you're full somebody, of wisdom. If you're somebody who's in business, he's one of those guys that I just love to throw questions out and just listen to him. I mean, none of us in here have a formal education in business, and I, I attribute at least 90% of the success that I've had in business to this man because of the the blueprint that he laid for us in my early 20s. And it was such a great training ground for me. And I've learned so much. So I love to sit down and just ask him any questions. And he obviously has moved his way into many other markets besides just fitness. So man, even if you're not a fitness person, if you're an entrepreneur by heart, or you're just interested in business, this is one of the greatest business minds that I've ever personally met. Oh, absolutely. I'm I'm with you, Adam. I'd say a, a large chunk of what I know about business leadership, sales, promotions, all that stuff uh, came directly or indirectly uh, from the guy that you're about to listen to us uh, have a great conversation with. Before we get into that episode, though, I do want to remind everybody, MAPS Aesthetic is still 50% off. It's half off all month long. Now, remember, this is the program that was designed and inspired uh, by bodybuilders, physique competitors, um, and bikini competitors. This is the program that you can use to shape and sculpt your body as you see fit. There's actually a component within MAPS Aesthetic that lets you pick body parts that you want to place special focus on and allows you to develop those body parts the way you see fit. That's why it's called MAPS Aesthetic. Remember, it's 50% off. Here's what you do to get the program. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0 for that discount. And we have other MAPS Fitness programs on that site as well. Uh, Some of them may suit you even better than MAPS Aesthetic. Make sure you go check them out. Uh, but without any further ado, here we are talking to the great Mark Mastroff. Did you get a good response from your your interview with us the last time? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people I hadn't talked to in a long time. So, <laughs> any, ruffle came, any feathers? Came out of the woodworks. Yeah, I'd say a few. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> I it's actually, awesome. uh, I've been making my rounds to uh, 24s in the area just because I still have guys that I know that are running clubs. Uh, a couple guys actually just came back to their company. And um, I'm trying to, it, Sal's doing the same thing right now too. We're just trying to get back. We've been stuck in here so much focusing on on media and getting all over the world that it's kind of funny to me. Sometimes we'll fly into like LA or Texas or Seattle and we have more uh, of a fan base 
outside of our own little city. And it's uh, it's just a testament to, to us needing to get back on the ground and go out and talk sure. to people. So I was uh, at 24 just last Friday and was speaking to all their trainers and uh, you know, everybody has listened to that episode. Like if you, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, everybody, if you worked at 24, or you're a trainer, it's gone, it's gone viral in 24 fitness. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I'm sure you saw they had a CEO change since we, yes, they so. did. I was going to bring that up to you. Go. I was wondering if it had something to do with that. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yes. They just had a CEO change. Who's who's the CEO now? The, 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 literally the last person that Mark was talking about. Oh. And this is just Mark right in the last 30 days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so he's in. He's out. Out. Yes. Oh, man. You get some- <laughs> Did you get some hate mail after that? No. <laughs> no, I got some. You're right, mail. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's even better, though. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah, interesting. Do you, th- do you think a time is going to come where that you think they're going to reach back out and, and want to do something with you? No, I don't think so. I think the group that owns it will try and drive hard for the next two or three years then try and exit. And then the markets will speak based on where they are yeah. and how they've developed over the last couple of years. But, you know, they're, they're trying to find their way and they keep shifting back and forth and gone from, you know, probably one, two, three, four, five, six leaders now. <clears throat> and so I think it's really hard to get stability and continuity, especially in any business, let alone our industry, Yeah, to go through six leader changes and now have a new guy in who's going to kind of drive it in his direction. Um, you have to wait and see. And the, the rumor I'm hearing, because I was just there, is – and when we were last, when we last hung out and talked, the guy that was there was trying to create the old school culture and, and be a little more sales driven and, and commissions and overrides and things like that. And then the latest I've heard is this guy's going back to the kind of Carl Ebert mentality where they're going to try and eliminate all the sales counselors and it'd be like a McDonald's where you come in and you just click on it and, and get a membership. What do you th- what do you think is the the biggest challenge of running a a big box gym today versus what it was like probably twenty years ago? Just the competitive landscape, not only in brick and mortar, but in you know digital. And so today, you know, you see kids at home. Like my daughter will be in her room saying, "I got to do an ab workout tonight." And she'll pull up some app mm. on abs today for free, and she'll do you know twenty minutes of ab work and core work in in her room. And so. People can go to digital and, and find a way to say, I exercise today and I feel good versus having to say, I got to drive my ass down to the gym. And one is kind of solo, one's community. So community will always bring people to the gym. They'll always do well. And then footprint and inconvenience where like a 24 has a lot of locations. So you belong to one, you get access to more. Yeah, That always plays well. But I think the competitive landscape, especially from the, the low cost guys like the Planet Fitnesses and Crunches out there. Um, competing with 24-Hour and LA Fitness and those in the middle. And then you've got, you know, the in- incursion of boutique. You know, there's tons and tons of boutiques out there uh, in the space, whether it's a UFC gym, boxing mm-hmm. boutique, or whether it's a Soul Cycle or mm-hmm. a Flywheel or a Orange Theory. And then you've got digital just compounding now where everybody's got the latest digital app. I've, I've seen so many come in my office like, here's my concept, here's my idea, here's the money I'm raising, here's why I'm going to be the winner at the end of the day. And then you've got Peloton out there saying, "Hey, just ride our bike. That's all you need." <laughs> yeah. You know, although how many of those apps answer. really are successful? Very few. Yeah. Very, very few. Uh, it's very difficult, and there's so much free out there that everybody wants free. Mm-hmm. And so to spend ten dollars a month, even though that's nothing in the scheme of things, people have a hard time uh, mentally saying, "I'm going to spend mm-hmm. that ten bucks." My my kids will do it. Like my son's uh, pounding the weights right now. And so he showed up with some guy's app he bought for $10. So I bought this app for $10 and he's showing me how to do better squats and better deadlifts. I'm like, well, I, I could have shown you how to do that. <laughs> yeah. He's like, dad, you don't know shit. Don't talk to me. You know, this guy knows oh, his no. shit. He's a bodybuilder. I'm like, okay, son. <laughs> he looks like it. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, people are making a lot of money through the digital space right now. And I think, I think someone may emerge eventually. There's a lot of people out there doing some cool things. There's a group out there called Fit Plan. I really like the the work they've done. Mm, they've I've gone more mm-hmm. fl- through influencers. I don't know if you've seen their app, but they have influencers that have tens of millions of followers that they bring their exercise into the Fit Plan program, and it's very good software. Group out of Canada, I think they're doing pretty good work. But you know, they they got to get after it because there's so much competition there. Well, yeah. one of the things that you used to talk a lot about, in fact, I believe you were one of the first people to do this research and hack the the key to success in a big box gym was the ability to keep your members for a long time. And one of the things that you used to talk about is that 
getting them involved in like a nutritional type of a program within the first 30 days would two, three X their, their lifetime in the gym. Do you still believe that's the formula? And do you think that a lot of people are, are, are still missing that? Yeah. Good question. I, I think it's part of the formula. So when we look at still today, you know, one of the keys for all of us is how we ingest and how we eat. And now we've got food delivery coming to us in all kinds of ways. You know, my wife is vegan, so she's got a delivery group that brings her food to the house with her salads and beans. And I tease her all the time. She has no protein coming in, but she's like, these beans have a lot of protein. I'm like, well, 4,000 of them do, but not 20. Um, but, you know, she'll, she'll throw some fish in and break out when she needs to. But I think that when you step back and look at um, the consumer, they need to educate themselves better on their eating habits and how they, how they bring nutrition to their body. Yep. And there are some things coming into the market now that you can specifically do around chem panel, you know, taking some blood and then mm -hmm. maybe uh, putting some saliva in there to get your biomarkers and then have custom nutrition brought to you so that your body's more in balance. But nutrition's key, how you ingest your food, when you exercise. And then I, I think continuing to motivate yourself in community. Mm -hmm. I think being around people that kind of are like you, that kind of get after, get after it like you do and want to exercise like you do, I think kind of gets you prescribed to kind of do it two to three days a week, which is really what the key to success is. Yeah. Do, you, do you see with the, because it look, you, you brought up boutique gyms uh, earlier in the, in the podcast, and I've seen that just explode. There were, there were very little, you know, 15 years ago, and now you're seeing what seems to be a lot of the growth in gyms is these boutique facilities. Is that true? Is that where you're seeing a lot of the growth, where they're getting more niche than kind of general big box, you know, just your weights and cardio type stuff? Yeah, no, good question. There's, I think there's several components and boutique is one. There, there was a definite peak in boutique a few years ago and it's kind of come back a little bit. Okay. Um, it's led by the big cities like New York and LA, Miami, places like that, Chicago, where there's urban settings with tons of people that can come in. And New York's kind of been really the key. Um, it's grown dramatically there and then it's kind of come back a little bit from a success basis. And then trying to get that out to the suburban markets a kind of a hit or miss. But boutique you know, it's been in the curve. It was there in the, the 80s and the 90s and then kind of came back a little bit in the early 2000s and went out. Now it's back in vogue. And then, you know, when the economy slows a little bit, if it should, then boutique kind of compresses a little bit because for folks to come in and spend $150 to $250 a month to belong to a 5,000 square foot concept doesn't always pencil. Mm. And as they look at their wallet, they kind of come back to traditional fitness does everything under one roof. But the other piece is on the other side of boutique is 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 a uh, low price, right? So Planet and Crunch, you know, those two groups now have close to two thousand locations open between them, and they probably have north of five and a half million members. So they're probably the biggest footprint out there. So you show up with a ten dollar club and you show up with a hundred fifty dollar boutique, and it kind of canvases both sides of the market. The boutiques are hitting the millennials. You know, they're kind of coming out saying, "Hey, I like this kind of feel." And then I think the $10 is starting to hit a lot of the, the consumer markets where people couldn't afford to get into the boutiques or hadn't been able to get kind of afford to 24 hours. They're kind of getting into that you know, great fitness box for 10 bucks mm -hmm. and enjoying the experience. What do you say mm -hmm. to the criticism? Because we've heard this a lot um, and we've brought this up in the past where a, a, the model seems to be in these big box, low cost gyms like Planet Fitness. It seems to be the, the model where we're trying to get as many people as possible to sign up and then we want as many as, of them as possible to never come back and use the gym because we don't have the capacity to even serve all of them. What do you say to those kind of – is that the model? Is that the model these guys are going after? I don't think so. Uh, you know, it could be deep inside, but our belief always has been that you, know, you want what I call walking billboards. You want people that you know, walk around town and go, hey, you look great. You lost weight. You're in shape. Where are you working out? Mm -hmm. At Crunch, you know, at UFC Gym at, you know, Planet, wherever it is. You want them to say that so that you bring their friends and the referrals. And that's really the key of the game. I mean, most members come through the referral network, as you guys know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think everybody wants them to work out and you can service them. Um, a good box with 10,000 members should see 20% of the people in the box a day. And a great one will see 30%. So if you've got 10,000 members in the rare box, that's a lot of members, you'll have 2,000 workouts a day. And if you're open 24 hours a day, that's not hard to service. Does that formula scale to pretty much from small box all the way to a larger box? It, it generally does. The larger boxes, if they have tennis and outdoor, can be higher penetration because you have a different clientele that comes in there. Mm -hmm. But almost everything I've seen in the industry and everyone I've talked to and all the work I've done, it's generally between 20 and 30 is kind of good to great. There's some that have 10% and you kind of give them a poor grade. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times I come into a club and I say, how many members do you have and what's your workout traffic? And that tells me, in 30 seconds, everything I need to know. Really? Okay, so I, here, here's a good question, because you said 
10,000 members, 20 to 30% should be using the gym. That's a big difference between 20 and 30%. You're talking about a 50% increase. What is it that the the gyms that get the most usage do different than the ones that don't? Like, what are the big keys? Yeah, good question. And just to make sure I'm clarifying that, that's just on a daily basis. Right. It doesn't mean those are the only members that train. Hopefully, 95% train every month. At some point, right. Yeah, but that's just a daily basis. And so the, the great ones are, obviously, parking lot. Strange answer. Really? Yeah, huh. you got to have car park. I mean, mm -hmm. I went to a fitness connection. Um, it's a group out of Texas. Great company. Guys used to work for us. You know, Bruce Nickel founded it. Um they have tw probably 70,000 square feet for 10 bucks. Holy cow. Right? Wow. But you get That's into That's a massive box. Yeah, you get into their parking lot, they got 400 car parks, uh -oh. which is amazing. <laughs> but when you pull in, 400 are used and you're waiting to get in there. <laughs> yeah. And so at some point they hit capacity because the parking lot can't conform to let mm -hmm. enough members come in and people start saying, I'm not going there because I can't find a place to park because I'm paying the ass. Oh, so wow. parking plays a key role. Then it gets into how the facility designed and built. How much cardio do you have? How much strength do you have? You know, is your club, is your footprint exercise? At, at 24, we got to a point where we were designing the facilities at 40,000 square feet. We had kids clubs, we had pools, we had basketball courts, we had juice bars. And pretty soon the, the footprint for exercise was down to like 12,000 of the 40. Mm. And you're like, shit, we can't get enough people in here to exercise. We get everybody in on the ancillary stuff. <laughs> they'll come, so, they'll come yeah. have a smoothie. Yeah, a smoothie, <laughs> but you can't work out. There's not enough free weights, there's not enough stuff in here. So we, we had to kind of reboot a little bit and change up the mix. And then we came into the low price. You take a 20,000 square foot crunch and as much as sixteen to 17,000 square feet is pure gym. Mm. It's got a small locker room, small lobby, and then everything else is, you know, all equipment. So you can have 150 pieces of cardio, and you can have a giant free weight section and probably about 80 pieces of selectorized. So you can push through a lot of people in that box. 24, we could do 3,000 workouts a day in that 40,000 square feet with 12,000 square feet of fitness. But when you get into these low price boxes, you can pound in, you know, a couple thousand people a day very comfortably. No oh, problem. wow. So that's why you can sell so many memberships at low price. So having more, the, you said the parking lot, having more of the gym be workout area, those two things contribute. Or is there anything else? No, of course, all the basics, you know, okay. friendliness, cleanliness, you know, creating community, good culture inside there, you know, you know, getting on top of everything. Nothing's down. You know, we always had a philosophy that there's no piece of equipment that was down for more than a few minutes. If it was, we took it off the floor. So we have maintenance techs on on staff, and if stuff goes down, we try to wheel it out, mm -hmm. repair it, and bring it back on. So make the club uh, feel special. Great music, great lighting. Uh, everybody's wearing headsets now and, and pods, but we still try to pump good music in there to create a good vibe. And if you like, you know, each community's a little different, but if you like your rock and roll or if you like your soul, mm -hmm. if you like your hip hop, it's kind of going to play for you. And then I think the trainers, right? The people that touch everyone is the is the training staff. So your training staff has to be top notch, not necessarily to train the people, but just to touch them and help them mm -hmm. and point things out to better exercise. Yeah, I remember when I would manage gyms. You know, when I I used to, I've been working out in gyms since since I was fifteen years, fourteen or fifteen years old, and I remember thinking, oh, the main thing that makes this gym successful or gym successful is just how the how much awesome equipment it is, how great it looks. Then when I started managing gyms, I remember I'd walk into facilities and. Within the same month, you know, we would produce, you know, a 20, 30 percent increase in revenue just because of new staff. And then I started to realize how important the, the team was in the gym. But I feel like a lot of uh, companies, a lot of fitness companies don't necessarily understand that. They think people will come in and buy a membership and they'll like it or they won't like it. Like how big of a role does, does the state, does like, for example, a sales staff play or the training staff in terms of the success of the gym? Yeah, good question. I mean, great question. It just depends on the concept you have. Okay, this is a good one. So, okay. you know, depending on where you're going at, I think if you take a look at 2-4, there's a period of time where they felt like, look, it's a field of dreams. Build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. Just build the box. It's beautiful and people will come and they'll get a certain number of members. There's other concepts. You got to go hustle. You got to be all over the place because no one knows your brand. You know, you open something new. Like we built 49ers Fit out here in San Jose. Um, beautiful club. Probably one of the nicest we've ever built. But you know, no one knows the brand. They don't know what's inside. They don't know it's 40,000 square feet with about 29,000 square feet of fitness. I mean, it's got more equipment in there than you've ever seen. It's got a huge turf area. So you have to kind of create your brand. You got to go hustle for that. You can advertise all you want, but you have to get after it. Mm. You know, and the component too that I, I, did, I skipped a little bit is, is fitness is great, but then group X, right? Classes. So you have to have an amazing Group X program. 
so that you know you draw in a lot of women and then some men who like to take the classes and you have to have a little bit of everything inside there and you got to be able to change that out based mm-hmm. on trends and what's going on today. I was going to say that's what really allows you to combat with the small boxes. That's what I see happening sure. right now. Mm-hmm. Like a really good large box will offer a lot of what these, you know, CrossFit orange theories are within the box. I would think that would be a major strategy uh, to hang with all of them. Yeah. yeah. No, I think I think you know Orange Theory's done a great job with technology, and they've drawn in you know a good footprint on their franchise basis, and they're rolling pretty well right now. Uh, again, it's it's one of those ones where after you filter through a community and you've enrolled everybody, you have a stable base, you're great. But if you've rolled everybody and they, there's not enough people to churn through again, you kind of mm-hmm. you hit a little bit of a wall on all the all the kind of boutiques. But some crush it, some do amazing jobs. I think. Uh, you know, if you take a look at SoulCycle, I love, you know, what they've been able to do and how they've grown their footprint. They have amazing numbers in all their sites. And they've got a competitive landscape now with so many cycling studios opening up. You know, they're probably the preeminent one, but there's at least mm-hmm. another six or seven below them in each community. Now, you say nice things about that, but I know you're an investor and this is your wheelhouse. What makes you stay away from not going and buying up 20 Orange Theories or a whole region or an area? Yeah, you know, it's passion about what you want to do and how you want to get after it. And I think building all those is just not easy. You have to have a dedicated, amazing team. And so I think that each group you look at has had, you know, a fortunate uh, amount of come back to your question on people. And so if you have great leaders and you've got a good team that can get after it, and I think you go, but you can only do so much. I actually think the U.S. is overpenetrated and as much fun as we have here, we can continue to perform at a high level. But the rest of the globe, when you compare it to the U.S., it's it's just starting. Mm. And so I like outside the U.S. personally as an investor, um, other than the spaces that we're competing in now. I like I like what we're, we're seeing with the low cost. I think that's going to continue to grow in a big way. And I think that some of the niche players that, you know, are getting after it. And, and I like what we're doing at UFC Gym because it's so different than everybody else when you get inside that box because you have, again, anywhere from Brazilian jiu-jitsu to Muay Thai to kickboxing, and then you get into all the traditional training and then all the new wave training as well, functional, et cetera. Uh, the daily ultimate training classes they do there are crazy. So you get a different clientele that's unique to the space. And so I think you have to find a way to kind of differentiate yourself. To yeah, kinda, I'm, to I'm, I mean, and this is, I'm not kissing your butt here. I think that the UFC gyms I've seen are the best equipped uh, gym chains I've ever been in. It, for someone who likes to work out, sure, mm-hmm. like I love working out. And so I know good equipment and I know what's fun and what's not. And they're extremely well equipped, um, uh, better than any other chain. I've, I've seen individual gyms that were very well equipped. Uh, but not chains. You were talking about international markets. What's the most exciting? Where do you see the most exciting growth right now overseas? Wow, it's everywhere. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do, um, the whole world's exploding when it comes to fitness. And groups like Ursa and others have done a great job in promoting health and wellness. But if you look at every continent, you know, probably other than the African nations, which are slowly starting to kind of get after it, the rest of the globe's just imp- exploding, and it's moving penetration levels. I think. The Scandinavian markets now are ahead of the U.S. in penetration. I saw in the last report, really? they're around 22%. Hmm. And <clears throat> we, we went into Scandinavia in the late 90s and built that big chain SAS out there. Hmm. So we, we within three years, went from zero to 160 locations. <clears throat> we acquired SATs out of small footprint. We acquired a group in Sweden. Now Sweden and Norway are the top two penetrated markets. They love fitness there. The Norwegians and the Swedes work out like maniacs. <laughs> so... Each market's a little different. I love Australia. It's a, it's like California. It's a, it's a coastal community. Everybody there gets after it really hard. They train. Everybody's working hard because they're going out to the beach. They gotta look good. So they, they really are very into fitness. Uh, Asia is growing and booming. You know, we did a lot of work out there. It continues to grow. If you look at China, uh, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, all those countries are booming when it comes to health and fitness, big time. The Middle East is growing. I was just down there uh, in November. And I was shocked. I went into a club in Kuwait, of all places. Oxygen? Just, yeah. No, it wasn't oxygen. It was a bodybuilding club, and it was like oxygen. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and they took me in. It was four levels, probably 100,000 square feet, 25,000 a level. Their nutrition room was probably twice the size of this, stacked with everything you could think of. And it had the biggest human beings I've ever seen in one place <laughs> in my life. I mean, they were pounding the weights. When I went to the leg floor, they have a floor just legs, probably 25,000 square feet of legs. It had probably 300 guys in there pounding it. Every floor was packed. Wow. And they, it was like the uh, Gold's Gym Venice in a day. Bodybuilders galore, 
uh, people training hard, six, five, 300 pound kids down to, you know, five, 10, 150 pound kids trying to get big. And it was amazing. So wherever you go, fitness is really starting to boom in a bunch of different ways. Not so much on the boutique side, in, mm. on the international. In some countries it is. Um, F45 came out of Australia. It's kind of coming here to the mm. U.S. and doing good work. But if you look at uh, most countries, there is traditional big box and then some low cost starting a little bit. Yeah. Mm. What do you think of the, the, the rise and now what seems to be the flattening out and maybe even the decline a little bit of the U.S. market for CrossFit? Like, what do you think of that business model and what they've done? And Because I'm looking at it now, and it seems like they've kind of plateaued a little bit and might even be declining a little bit in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, they they changed the landscape, right? So those guys did amazing mm-hmm. work. But uh, there are others uh, that are just kind of fingering off of those guys, like uh, Jason Kalipa here in the Bay Area. Right. He's done really good work with his NorCal kind of CrossFit group and, and uh, the way he's kind of digitizing it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm really a big fan of him and what the work he's doing. And CrossFit's booming outside the U.S., so they may be plateauing here because they've kind of hit all the markets, um, but they're booming outside. But remember, CrossFit's model was, in my opinion, my CrossFit model wasn't necessarily a franchise model, of course, or even a licensed model. It was a training model where they went after certifying their trainers to be CrossFit trainers, and then they allowed you to buy the franchise for low dollars, and then you could open up next to another CrossFit mm-hmm. or block away or five blocks away. You could have 10 in within a mile. There was really no barrier to entry. And so they've created a competitive landscape among themselves. That was their approach. And it seemed to work really well. And I think it's working pretty well internationally. But I know that it gets tough when you build a studio in a brand and you you get after it and somebody comes across the street to compete with you in the same brand. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. that can't be a good feeling. Yeah. Inter- it's, it's been interesting to watch for sure. It feels like they came out of nowhere and then exploded and completely changed the way people even worked out. Which brings me to, to my next question, you know. I just saw some statistics recently that showed that the U.S. life expectancy uh, is now declined like the second time in a row. And, and they're showing that a lot of it has to do with suicides, which have been up, um, and opiate overdoses. Um, but it seems like our overall health hasn't uh, improved and is still continued to get worse. But we have more gyms, more people you know, working out, or, or at least more people aware of working out. Like, What are we doing wrong? Like, Why are we not able to tackle this uh, this problem? And is... You know, people like you who, you know, obviously you're, you're, we consider you the godfather of, of the gym industry. Like, do you think about that? Like, how can I how can I make a big impact? How can we besides selling memberships? Like, how can we get people to actually, you know, get healthy? Yeah. We, I mean, you've spent so much time on it till you're blue in the face. And, you know, part of it is, I think, building more product. So a lot of markets are still underserved, especially um, lower economic communities. So it's tough to find retail spaces in those communities and spaces you can develop. Part of it is a discipline for people where, you know, it's just hard to go exercise. It's hard to walk. It's hard to do things. Part of it is to take the easy road out. You know, I just sit at home and Mm -hmm. I can pull my app up now and I can say I worked out for an hour. I can close my three rings on my Apple Watch, which is amazing, (laughs) you know, but I got to walk and do some things to kind of crush it every day. And I Mm -hmm. I get after it, set my clerk burn. I love my Apple Watch. Um, (laughs) But I I really think at the end of the day that whenever you walk around, my wife and I are constantly looking at people and saying that, you know, we are just such an obese society and it's the way that we ingest our food and it's the fast food, you know, it's the the chips and the sodas and all the things that we're trying to curb <clears throat> that basically go inside your body. You don't realize the damage it's doing and how hard it's to overcome. And then when you get to a certain point where you're 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, it's a lot of work to get that off. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of work mm. and people get after it for a little bit and they see how hard it is and they just pull back. <clears throat> So I think it's it's the point where you reach that point of no return in your mind and eventually a call to action will happen. The doctor will say, you're about to have a heart attack. The doctor will say, you have diabetes and you're going to lose you know, a limb in your body unless you make a change in your, mm-hmm. your lifestyle quickly. It could be that you know a friend of mine once told me, his son looked at him and said, daddy, are you pregnant? Uh, <laughs> it could be all those types of things that there's an impetus that kind of gets you back into health and fitness. Um, but a lot of us that come through the fitness industry, we kind of get an idea of what it's about because we work there. And everybody I see that's been in the gym business, we're all in pretty good shape, right? You guys are all shredded. You're all in phenomenal condition right now. So what I tell everybody is go work in a gym for six months or a year. Get a job there. Work out every day. Learn how to get your body in great condition. Get inspired by the industry. And maybe that'll help change your life a little bit. But this country is obese. It's just the way it is. And the 
cardiovascular diseases that are coming this way is bringing the the average mm-hmm. life down and where they've talked about your children won't live as long as their parents mm-hmm. right let's talk about inactivity a little bit i kind of want to get into the esports and uh the the surge of the popularity of this is just baffling to me and uh seeing all these acquisitions happening through the nba and just because you know we're we're trying to address this problem of obesity and yet we're seeing this huge rise in popularity in in it, like these types of things that where it's just promoting more inactivity it seems yeah no it's it's we always call it head down mm. right wherever you go now everybody's heads down so I always tease everybody that I can walk through a room and nobody knows I was there because everybody's heads down in their phone streaming watching listening viewing texting typing whatever it might be. Um, esports is interesting because you know you do burn a ton of calories because of the stress around the way you're playing. <laughs> um, my my 14 year old will play as much as we let him, and he'll stand to play, and he jumps up and down. He runs. You can hear him jumping in the room. You know he's a 210 pound 14 year old monster, and he'll pound the floor, and I'll be yelling at him, "You're gonna break the roof." Um, <laughs> but he loves his esports, and he's very active around it. Um, it works his mind quite a bit. The interesting byproduct is, though, that they get used to losing. Hmm. Because if you play Fortnite to be a champion of 100, you know, if you're playing on a single basis, it's not very easy. You might win, you know, one out of every 20. So you lose 19 times, you just click and go at it again. So these are going to be kids that are okay with a no. Oh, that's interesting. That's to a interesting. Yes. I didn't that's, even think of that. What a positive spin mm-hmm. on what we're seeing, because we're seeing the opposite in kids that are playing sports, that are getting trophies for last place, right. whatever, like that. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's objective. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, it's. It, it, I have a ten-year-old as well, and so last year he was playing in a basketball tournament, and I remember they lost the game, and all the kids were kind of okay, and they shook the hands of the other team. They lost like the championship game. They walked off the court, and the, the coach was like, I mean, "I'm used to kids crying when they lose a game like this." I'm like, "That doesn't happen anymore. These guys are used to losing Fortnite every day a hundred times. <laughs> they don't really care. They just play as hard as they can, and if they lose, they lose on their own hmm. own terms." So it's, it's a change in society a little bit. I think it's really interesting. And you can see it emanating all over the place. It's like, okay, I lost. You know, mm-hmm. I, I busted my ass the best I can, but I'm not going to cry over it because I'll play again tomorrow. Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at it. And I, I, I have to say, I agree with you. That's mm-hmm. actually quite, I, I didn't even think of it that way. Now you're invested in the eSport uh, market, right? If you yes. wouldn't mind going over kind of what, what that looks like for you or what that is. Yeah, so we, I think you guys had Andy Miller on, on your cast. We and, did. And um, Andy and I, again, he's a partner of mine um, in the Kings up in Sacramento, and we sit together at games. And a few years back, we started talking about how our kids are playing a lot of esports. And then Andy's like this maniac sports, brilliant guy. And so he went did some research, came back, like, I think we should buy an esports team, have some fun. So that led to buying one, buying two. And now we've got like 10 and competing all over the world in all these different types of esports gaming and and it's been really interesting because it's not tens of millions it's hundreds of millions and billions of people playing esports right now it's and yeah. it's growing like crazy and so you, you have fortnite come out that takes over the world and epic games makes three billion dollars last year and it's like second year of operations wow. and then you have apex come out this year right through um, their development and, and they're already at 50 million people in like 30 days playing their game. Wow. And they're crushing it right now. And kids hmm. are similar, but, but kids like it better than Fortnite in some ways. And they like Fortnite better in other ways. And so you've got that going on. Then you've got Overwatch, which has these professional teams. And we own the Bay Area Overwatch team called the San Francisco Shock. And those guys are, you know, we're top two or three in the world playing teams all over the world now. They've set this league up where we're playing teams out of China and Korea, out of London and Paris, I mean, Middle East are going everywhere. They'll have a 50 teams around the world you're competing with for national and international trophies. And so all these kids are making a ton of money through their streaming. Hmm. And so these guys are having people watch them, 30, 40, 50,000 people at night watching them stream, getting paid. Now, how, how do you monetize that? How are you as an owner making profits off of that? Yeah, good question. So we, we kind of make it through our streaming in, in our shared streaming through some of the tournaments where we take a small share that we let the kids take the vast majority. They probably get almost all of it. And then sponsorships really where it is. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And then some of these leagues now that are coming up. So like we own the rights, as I said earlier to the to Bay area, kind of Northern California for overwatch. And so we bought that team for a uh, 20 million bucks. And so we own that. And then there's, it's like the NBA. Now there'll be rev share that'll come in mm. as the business continues to grow globally. 
through their sponsorships and things they do. And so hopefully you grow it up like an NBA team or an NFL team or a Major League Baseball team. And this this is your market that you're competing with for many years well, to come. Now I looked and, and I and I thought I mean correct me if I'm wrong that um, they were also like investing in teams for like NBA 2K or something along those lines to where um, you know the New York Knicks or whoever has like a team that represents like the New York Knicks through NBA 2K and then they're going to compete and yeah so the NBA saw that and Adam Silver super smart and he said look there's the millennials are playing esports we got to you know. <laughs> kind of get into the esports game and there's always been NBA, you know, 2K right. out there. Oh, yeah. All my kids have played it. You know, they they Huge. know every shot, every move in the world. And so they created leagues where the teams could kind of buy and then play against each other. I don't think that footprint's done phenomenally well yet. They're going to have to grow it over the years to come. Mm -hmm. But each team, and a lot of the teams, not all of them, but most of the NBA teams bought their rights like the Kings bought ours and Shaquille O'Neal is our our general manager that oversees it and they compete and they have people watching and play. And then uh, it'll grow. It'll be interesting, but it's not going to be as popular as these other games where, mm -hmm. you know, League of Legends has 500 million people following it. You're just not going to get into that realm. But I think as it grows and esports continues to grow, there'll be an overlap. And especially now as everything's heading towards betting, right, and gambling. Mm -hmm. So esports is going to have that come, I'm sure. Oh, and man, that'll be huge. Yeah. It'll be crazy. So that's the future for all of sport. Well, I was going to ask you, and I'm kind of getting towards that because I can see that you know, they're, they're looking at all these, you know, popular trends coming in and seeing how they can sort of get their foothold in. And I saw that the LA Clippers actually had this is called court vision. And I was wondering if you had seen that experienced it, like your thoughts about that. Yeah. So we have in the Kings, we have a lot of tech guys. Um, so we've got, you know, Vivek who came out of Tibco and then the Jacobs family, right. Who come out of Qualcomm. And so we had the Oculus glasses before anybody did like in 13, when you we were in construction on our arena, you could oh, put wow. the Oculus glasses on and actually walk to your seat. Oh, sick. So we were way ahead of everybody in some respects. Those guys had set all that up. And then we had even gone with Google Glass when they came out for that period of time before they kind of decided to pull back on that, where you could have Google Glass and you could see from the vantage point of someone sitting on the floor seats. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you could see the game from that seat. So I think all that's coming and it will continue to come. Whether people like that experience or not, we have to wait to see how, how you know, the, the jury verdict is there. But- I think that there'll be more and more tech coming into the game and statistics and information if you like that. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to get to the experience where your head is down and you're not really seeing the game, you're seeing the statistics. So I kind of worry a little bit about that because I, I enjoy the purity of the game right. and the things yeah. that happen. Like we, we played Boston last night and there's times in the game where it gets pretty heated and you know shit happens and F-bombs get dropped and you kind of want to see all that right. and experience all that in, in the game within the game. And I think if fans could kind of see a little bit more of that and be maybe to the point where the players are miked. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would know, be awesome. Where you could kind of hear exactly what people are thinking to the point where I've always felt like at the end of the game, if there's eight seconds left and you go into the huddle – and the coach has three plays, you could put it out to the fans saying, here's our three plays, which one do you want us to run? Oh, wow. And then let the fans vote, okay, we're running play two. <laughs> well, I, wanted to do, I wanted to do that in preseason. I, and, trip, and then have the fans vote too and have it work and go, the fans are right. Hey, you guys screwed up, man. We didn't even get the ball in bounds. Everybody high fives. <laughs> you know? yeah. I've speculated we're going to have, and because we have, the, the tech is there. So I think it's only a matter of time before every player is mic'd and camered up. Yep. And I will have the ability, my me and my best friend are watching the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be I'm gonna see through Tom Brady's perspective and he's gonna th see through some lineman's perspective, right? Donald's and he and we're gonna be able to play or watch the game and experience it from their perspective. That's what I think we're going with that. No, there, there's streaming services now where you can buy and just watch one player. Mm, so wow. there's stuff that's coming now where if you just want to watch LeBron the whole game, that's all you'll see. Oh, wow. I think that's starting to be the next level and the, and the teams will start selling those rights. So it can get to wherever you want to get to. And I think as as kids get better now uh, at everything they want to do, you know, they just go to an app. So I, I remember um, a few years ago, my son had a school dance. So it had to be eighth grade. So it's three years ago. And he says, I'm going to go to the eighth grade dance. He'd never been to dance in his life. I'm like, dude, what are you going to do there? Are you going to dance? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to dance. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. So he goes to the dance. I don't think anything about it. The next day I see some mom who was chaperoning the dance said, your son's like the most amazing dancer I've ever seen. I'm like, what are you talking about? He can't dance at all. He has no rhythm. And so he comes back from school that day. And I'm like, hey, I hear you danced really well at the dance last night. I go, who told you that? I go, well, and the mom said she saw you. How the hell did that happen? He goes, 
Oh, well, before I went to dance for three days, I got this dance app and I practiced in my room every move. <laughs> no, oh, hey. shut up. <laughs> so when I got there, I was uh, ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's so great. great. That's Mark, you have your, I mean, you've got your hands in I mean, so many businesses that the last time I think we talked, uh, you said, I don't even know if I could rename them all. What does it take to give you a business boner? today like what <laughs> what does it take to get you excited about something like where you get like a little kid and giddy about something I, I think it's doing something really different you know it's like uh, something that's never been done before I think those things are really cool you get to places you've never been and never thought you would be uh, yeah give me an example fun? of like the, in the last year that the last thing that you came home and were excited to tell your wife about something you were proud of or that you screamed out loud yeah, so without giving away too many keys to the kingdom, we, you know, there's a couple of things I think that are really interesting. So I'm really good friends and partners with Alex Rodriguez. And so Alex, of course, is is dating one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life, Jennifer Lopez. And so we spent a bunch of time with them, my wife and I, and, and get a kick out of it. But sometimes you'll sit and listen to the things that Jennifer is doing that blows your mind. Really? Because she'll be in the middle of something where she could probably build a billion dollar business an hour if she wants to and may elect to or not elect to do it. And Alex at the same time is now with his ESPN and baseball. He's 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 a savant. He's one of the few people I've met in my life is that whatever you tell him, it's in his head. He memorizes it's, it's in there for life. Wow. He can bring conversations up from three years ago and repeat them verbatim. He can tell you every pitch he hit from every pitch in every game, no matter what it is. You can say, what happened in that game against the Yank- against the uh, Boston in 2012? He'll tell you every at bat. Wow. He just got a photogenic memory. And you sit with those guys, and sometimes they'll bring things that they're doing that will, you know, they'll say, we're going to make a movie, and here's what it's going to be, and here's how we're going to do it. And you listen to that, and you just go, oh, that's unbelievable. And then they pull it off, and you're like, holy shit. You know, that world just is just crazy to me. And the two of them are just phenomenal um, at all that they do. On my side of the house, my little world doesn't even compare to theirs. You know, you look at w- what's really interesting. And we took the UFC gym concept and we said, look, I think it's a really interesting concept globally. The brand's huge. Dana White's done amazing work and gone all over the world and laid these fights down. There's fighters from all over the world. Let's go out and, and, and sell the rights and franchise in a master way all over the country. And so Adam Sedlak, kind of the president, gets out there. He's got Tamer L. Gundy, who's kind of the head of international sales. Those guys start marching. And two years later, they're in 30 countries right now. And Adam's sitting wow. Adam's sitting about halfway around the world right now, trying to finish another deal to do three more countries. And I've just been blown away at what they've been able to accomplish in a short period of time. And then these boxes are opening up in all these countries, and you just can't believe the number of people enrolling because it's such a different concept. Yeah, And you're like, you know, you get pretty excited by taking something from nothing to where now you're sitting at 30 countries heading to 40 and people opening gyms, like 20 gyms in Australia. Gyms are going to Oman. They're going into Dubai. They're going into Egypt. We, the guys out there just opened their first. They're about to open their second, 70,000 square feet. Um, there's a guy opening a gym in Pakistan under the UFC gym brand that no one's even seen. What? 150,000 square feet. Wow. Whoa. Um, wow. China, China just got signed for a massive deal. So you're seeing this happen in front of your eyes in a short period of time, and you see there's demand for something unique and different and a great offering, and you got a great team executing on it. So that gets you pretty excited in the morning. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's rad. What do you uh, What do you see? How, what percentage of memberships are being sold online now versus in person? I mean, when I when I had left the big box gyms, we weren't selling really any online, but I can I imagine now quite a few now are yeah, coming through good, that way. Good question. I think in the the um, high value, low price. You know, they're probably at north of 30%. Wow, that yeah. much. Yeah, because it's a $10 decision for a lot of people. So people just go online and buy yeah, it. Yeah, you go, hey, crunch, 10 bucks. I'm in. It's not a big deal. Um, I think you get to the higher prices, it's very low. It could be 3 to 5%. Mm. I think guys like 24 are probably doing pretty good work because people <clears throat> have been in there before. They've seen the box. And if they discount it, because sometimes you find you walk into 2-4 and you say, I want to buy a membership. And the guy whispers, well, you're better off going online because you save 5 bucks a month. And you go, oh, cool, I appreciate that. And you just go online, you save five bucks. Oh a my month God, online. I would hate that. If I was or, you, or you go to Costco because they give free there. So, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it used to be like, I would, I would never sell at Costco. I'm like, why would I do that? You know, and you show them the Costco and you can buy two years for 228 bucks. And you're like, I just left the gym at 40 a month. What's going on here? $1,000 on one side, 228 in the other. I'll just take this 228. So, depending on your strategy, if you look hard enough, you know, there's ways to buy online that, mm-hmm. that cheapens the price. 
But the high-end brands, the Soul Cycles, the world, that type, they're, they're not going to discount too much online. So you just buy it as, as an in-store. Experience. Now, with, with marketing for gyms, um, I know that's changed a lot. And now we're seeing the growth of uh, and the explosion of new media and influencers from new, ve- new media versus the old way, which was you know TV, radio, newspaper, um, and then your, your traditional celebrities. Are you guys looking in that new media route, like okay, YouTube channel, podcast, you know, influencers promoting our stuff versus an athlete? Are, are you guys looking at that that kind of stuff? Yeah, we've been doing that forever and ever, and you know, it's hit and miss and how mm-hmm. it works. And I think that you know, a lot of people are, are, are marking on a digital basis, and then you know, you take Facebook and others; they change the algorithms all the time, so you're not sure. You know, even third party agencies of how to buy. So I think it's uh, traditional old school isn't as popular as it once was, direct mail, print, TV, radio. They're still there, but not as great as they were one time. So a lot of people kind of spend money in digital social influencers, mm-hmm. uh, which we've done a lot of work with. And it's, you know, again, it's to me back to the facility it is, how good is it? As you mentioned earlier, like the UFC gyms and others, you know, Mike Feeney does our boxes. Mike's probably a legend in the industry. He did all the 24s mm-hmm. with me. He's been buying equipment since he's a little boy. He's been designing building clubs since he's a little boy. He's just phenomenal at it. He's kind of kid that works out every day, trains like a maniac. So he'll go to Ursa and he won't go for the, in, that Ursa's our industry show, if you don't know, but he'll go to Ursa, not the day it opens. He'll go the day before because he wants to all the, watch all the equipment get built. He's one of those guys oh, like, yeah. I want to see how you build it, how durable it is, how hard it is to build, how hard it is to maintain. Smart. So he's really into the weeds, but he's got all the latest and greatest toys. He always puts them in the facility. So when he builds a box, it's always kick-ass. Like if you go see the 24-hour, because he built that, I mean, excuse me, a 24-hour that he built back in the day, and you see a UFC gym that he built. And if you go down and see, like take 49ers and how he's kind of grown everything, it's pretty interesting what it looks like today versus the 24s he built 10 years ago. Do you see any any current trends with uh, with fitness equipment? I remember when ellipticals came in and that became a big thing and hammer strength became a big thing. Do you see any, any new equipment manufacturers or, or, or new types of equipment that are coming through? Yeah, there's always new stuff that comes out, but the, the gym industry is moving more to functional. As you know, there's more open space. That's the big trend. In, yeah, where you yeah. can bring in all kinds of toys. You can bring in your Ninja Warrior training if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you can bring in your Bulgarian bags, your kettlebells, your ropes, you know, mm-hmm. your, your plow boxes and everything else to kind of create that functional class. Uh, but then traditional is still there. There's a lot of cardio and then uh, a lot of strength. Everybody's still pounding it. And then platforms have become big because obviously you look at the work that, you know, CrossFit did and platforms are in, in the facilities now in a big way. So maybe you had two. Now you got five. Some clubs are going to 10. And people are coming in lifting hard, and, and it's a lot of women. I mean, women are in phenomenal shape coming out of that CrossFit concept into the traditional gyms now, and they stay after it. And so it's fun to watch how hard the women are pounding, you know, there as well as the as the young kids and the men. Yeah, the the I mean, what a huge difference that was from when I was in these big boxes. Squat racks were like you had like one or two in a huge facility, and we didn't have a cage, and let alone a platform. Now you're seeing bumper plates and platforms and these and these are in the in the mainstream big box gyms that we're we're starting to see that. Yeah, is, they have to have it to compete. You have to have it. It's like it's a great. no-brainer. So great. it's been fun to watch. You know, something I wanted to ask you, I'm so glad it just popped in my mind that I didn't get a chance to ask you a long time ago. It was a something that happened it was a controversy way back when I think it was I want to say it was in late 90s or maybe early 2000s when 24 Hour Fitness put up a big billboard and it said, and I know you know you know what I'm talking about. It had a picture of an alien, and it had the, the flying saucer, and it said, "When they come, they'll eat the fat ones first. Yeah, <laughs> do you guys remember that? Such great marketing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and then it got like really bad publicity and bad press. And then uh, what, how did that work out? Because I think it gave you guys more attention than than good attention than bad. Yeah, no, I mean it's a long time ago when we did it, <laughs> and, a, and a, a young kid in the ad agency came to us and and uh, so I have this idea. It's a little crazy, and I just loved it. And I, I, saw, and I can't remember his name. I feel bad. I'll have to look it up. But he, he, it was his idea. I gave him all the credit. And I said, it's a hell of an idea. Let's do it. Let's, and, and it was going to be like an ad campaign. I said, no, let's just put on a big-ass billboard on the San Francisco Bay Bridge and let's just go for it. So we bought this big-ass <laughs> billboard and we stuck it up there. And, you know, I went up there for like a day. And then um, there was some gal who came out of nowhere who was with um, a group of overweight people feeling that we were, you know, being negative towards them. And the next thing I know, I'm on the Today Show. 
<laughs> and she's on one side, I'm on the other. Matt Lauer's interviewing me. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know you were on oh, their wow. debate. So you had to debate or discuss We had a all debate, of- and, and I felt like I crushed her. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, look, we're not picking on fat people. We're just saying that if they come, they're going to be hungry, and they're going to look for people <laughs> a little more plump. Um, and and we had this big controversy. It just went viral at that time. If today's world, it would have been 10x that. But right. it went all over the place that people got a kick out of it. And we created a big campaign around it. And then you know, a few days later, I remember everybody got behind it and thought, you know, this is a way to kind of just put it out front around at that time talking about the obesity epidemic, which was probably nothing compared to what it is today. And we got just, uh, you know, infamous amount of uh, love mail and hate mail, let's put it that way for a period of time. But it, it was it was impactful. Yeah. Would, would you say it was a successful campaign? Oh, yeah. It crushed it. Yeah. It created a lot of awareness. And wherever we went, people talked about it, no matter where. They still talk about it. I actually have... <laughs> I have a home up in the, in the mountains and I have one of the shirts that I, I had made back in the day and it sits in the closet. And every once in a while I look, I just crack up. Yeah, I had oh, one of those yeah. shirts. Yeah. I lost it though, damn it. Yeah. Have you it. tried to recreate that? Like other ideas like that, that are kind of, you know, you're going to get some bad pub. We did that similar campaign all over the world in different markets. Like we went to China, we did it. The Chinese did it in their way. And it was a massive you know, media success out there. We did it in Russia. We were in Russia um, where we talked about things we'd done successfully and people kind of piloted it out there and installed it and then enrolled with it. So in Russia, people got a kick out of it. They thought it was funny as hell. They didn't really care. Yeah. Um, not easily offended. Yeah, like they're, they're not there wasn't offended. a lot of obesity in Russia. The Russian people were, you know, pretty damn good shape. Uh, we went to China. There's not a lot of obesity out there. They thought it was very, very funny and very clever. And it went all over the place. And so we did a bunch of things. We did in Singapore, I remember. And the Singaporeans got a kick out of it. So it just depends where we dropped it. But we did roll it out several other times over the years. Mm. What are some other, uh, I guess, successful campaigns you've run in the past? What are some of the most successful ones that you've run where? Because I remember you guys had at one point. Look Better had, Naked was a big deal. We that did. one, that did you guys invent that that term? Because I, I hear it all the time, but I, I remember it being an old. You know, I, I, I don't know that we invented it because other industries had used it. Okay. Um, but I don't know that it was used in the gym space before we used it. Uh, so it's hard to say, um, you know, campaigns were depending on where you went and what you did were different. Uh, the guys in Vegas, uh, Todd Smith and Chad, those guys, uh, Rudy Smith, who's an industry legend, um, came up with a campaign where women join free and so can the men. And it's basically a no enrollment campaign. <laughs> and so Todd was with me at, uh, two, four for a long time. Todd's one of the best, one of the greatest of all time. And then, um, I stole that from him. They said I could use it. We took it out to Asia. And I remember we, we brought it into Singapore and we said women could join free in a small print and say so could men. So we didn't you know, get anybody upset. And I remember that the phones rang so heavy that day that the whole system crashed in every club we had. Wow. They, oh, wow. they had, I think, over 5,000 tours in one day off that campaign. Wow. What? So depending on where you take things, they kind of land in different places and hit people in different ways. But that I remember that was a really interesting campaign that we ran. And then here... We, we kind of, you know, what was really funny is in the very, very early days, and I don't know if I, I talked to, I don't know if I told about the story about last time uh, about Arthur Jones at all. No. Talk so, a, little, a little bit about Arthur. So, much. yeah, so I'll tell you a quick story. So Arthur Jones created an all equipment, right. right? Very famous. And when I first worked in the industry, I was a trainer. And the manager came over to me and said, okay, you're going to train on Nautilus equipment. That's all we have. Here's your book to learn how to do Nautilus. And I read the book like that night, and now I'm a trainer. I'm sure I blew four or 500 people's backs out over the next couple of years, not knowing what the hell I was doing. So I went in there and, and we, we did it. And then six months later, I become the manager and become a partner in the gym. And I'm sitting there one day and one of my guys says, you know, we got a grand opening anniversary coming up. Who should we have come here? And I'm like, well, Arthur Jones has, he's like 60 years old. He has this 25 year old wife named Terry. And she's got this picture in this string bikini. Let's, let's call her. So I call Orlando and I, I get to the office and I said, I want to talk to Terry Jones. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to get some secretary, somebody leave a message, whatever, get a hold of her. So just a minute. And then they buzz me through and I get this girl on the phone and it's her. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm this club called Nautilus Health Spa. It's my first gym. It's 5,000 square feet. I'm in San Leandro, California. You know, would you be interested in coming out and helping us with our anniversary party? She's like, Oh, I'd love to. Let me talk to Arthur. So I give her my phone number. She calls me back the next day. Arthur and I are going to fly out. Wow. So Arthur Jones and her fly out. I set up this whole party. And she had this picture where she's in this like uh, Bo Derek type bikini at the time. Bo Derek was the big girl of the I day. Remember, yeah. And so I drop that picture in the paper and I say she's coming. We had maybe 8,000 people in line <laughs> to see <laughs> Holy her. Holy shit. 
because she's in a bikini. I never run a bikini yet. For the rest of my life, every time I ran that ad, the phones would ring off the hooks to the point where women, <laughs> you're you're not, you know, she's in a bikini. It's not right. You shouldn't advertise that way. This is like in the 80s and 90s. I'm like, well, I mean, bikinis ain't that big a deal. I'm not lingerie. I'm not doing, you know, right. Victoria's Secrets or anything. It's not that big a thing. But Terry, so Terry Jones and Arthur come out. I meet Arthur. Arthur tells me, okay, she, I'm going to leave her with you. Make sure she's home by 10. I don't want her partying. She gives me all these rules. He goes, <laughs> and I got a machine gun, you know? And I'm like, okay. So um, Arthur leaves. She ends up doing this whole night. We crush it. We have a lot of fun. At 10 o'clock, she's like, I want to go out partying. I'm like, no, Arthur said you can't. <laughs> I'm going to go partying. I don't give a shit what Arthur says. So I'm like, oh my God, I better take her because she gets kidnapped. I'm going to get shot by Arthur Jones. And if you ever read about Arthur Jones, I mean, he was about he was know, three things. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was crazy. He was about bigger crocodiles, faster airplanes, and ammunition. And so anyway, we went out with Terry Jones. I think we went out to like two in the morning and I brought her back to her, her uh, hotel and dropped her off just praying Arthur wasn't awake and to shoot my ass. <laughs> and, and we just had this successful opening, but that picture we had of Terry, of her just sitting there on her knees in a bikini, wasn't that risque in any way, shape or form, used to, whenever we ran, it used to just somehow resonate with people and it just would, phone would ring off the hook, good, bad and indifferent. We would just mm. flood the club with members back in the early days of the industry. Also, is, now, there, is there anybody in the industry, in, in the gym or fitness industry that you just, you love to just fuck with? You love to just, <laughs> if they open a club, I want to fuck with them. Or or you see them do something, you're like, I just want to take them down. Uh, you can't get it to take down anymore. But back in the early days, we used to have a lot of fun with that, you know, because guys would come in and try and encroach in your area. Um, but there's a lot of friends I have in the industry that have a lot of fun with. I, I love <laughs> Brahm Akrati from Lifetime. Okay. So if you know Brom, um, Brom's built probably the behemoth in the industry right now that nobody ever talks about. He's got this company called Lifetime Fitness. They build 150, 200,000 square foot beautiful pipe gyms. facilities. Huge. Beautiful. He's actually building the first one in the Bay Area in Walnut Creek. He's doing a $100 million four-story <sighs> in downtown Walnut Creek. And I've been giving him shit about it because I said, man, that's, I live close to there. It's a tough place to drive to. I don't think I'd even drive the five miles to go there at night. <laughs> the traffic on 680, 24 is a bottleneck. Yeah, yeah, but, but he's going to drop a hundred million dollar box there and, and, and try and get after it. So I, I give him shit about that, but he's, he's phenomenal at what he does. And he and I kind of grew up with nothing. Both of us started at the same time. We almost actually worked together, um, but he went off on his path and built these big boxes, 30, $40 million a box. Slowly, but surely has grown that thing into the behemoth now. And uh, he's a lot of fun to, to mess with. And he likes to mess with me. So I'm always like, build your box. I'm going to put 10 around it. <laughs> you got the big gunship. I got a bunch of PT boats and we're going to have some fun. So you know, we'll tease each other. And then there's other guys. I mean, I like Chin Yi at LA Fitness. Um, those guys were a lot of fun to play with because they started after us and they kind of, I think, copied a little bit of what we did. And they've had a lot of success. They, I think they've done phenomenally well. Um, and have become actually they're probably the biggest in the industry now. They're bigger than everybody. Mm. Oh, are they really? About. Yeah, they're they're a phenomenal company that um, has by far probably the most revenues, most cash flow by far on top of everybody out there. Yeah. They, they've got silent. some of your they've got some of your old guys there, right? Some yeah, of the old a lot of lot of our guys are there. Yeah. Now it sounds like everybody seems to be pretty good sports. Like even though you guys are in the same market and could be or considered competitive, nobody's an asshole. Nobody rubs you the wrong way. There's there's guys at times that get a little ego driven that come in and you know they think like their shit doesn't stink and they're the best that ever come. And I I'm pretty pretty humble, pretty quiet. I don't really care, but I'm very strategic. So. If they want to come in and mess, then we just kind of go at it in a different way. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we see who's standing at the end of the day. Um, but you know, generally, everybody's pretty good. The, the one thing about our industry in the early days, and, and not so much as today that's a little different, is that you know, we're all friends. You know, so it didn't matter. Um, Brahmak Rai, you know, he could build a big company right next to me, and Chin Lee could open up LA Fitness. Mm -hmm. We just felt like there's plenty of room for all of us, and we would talk to each other and compete against each other, but we didn't cry about anything. We all did well, and... You know, we never damage each other. We didn't try and steal staff from each other. If we did, I'd just say, look, I'll steal your staff. You steal mine. It doesn't get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we were pretty good about it. Uh, today, a lot of the guys come outside the industry. And I remember like even when a Carl Lieber showed up, he's like, you know, you can't talk to the competition. Like, so it's kind of like saying, you mean an NBA coach can't talk to another NBA coach. Mm -hmm. A GM can't talk to another GM. It doesn't make sense to me. A college coach can't talk to another college coach. We all are friends. We don't mind yeah. talking about shop and scarcity from each mindset other. right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to, I used to say anyone could come into our company anytime and see what we're doing because executing is a different gig. I remember Mark Smith and the whole team from TSI in New York came out and spent like a week at 24 going through our IT, our sales systems, everything. We we're like, hey, come take a look. And then they went back there and they didn't execute on any of it. None of it worked for them. 
but we would be happy to share. It didn't matter. There's no secrets. Mm. Are there any, are there any other like CEOs and it can, this can be in other spaces other than yours that you follow that you're impressed by like the Mark Cubans of the industry and people like that. Are there other people you watch and you're very impressed with the way they operate? Well, I think like everybody, you're really interested in how Jeff Bezos, you know, kind of gets after it in the way that he does. Um, you take a look at Elon Musk and his vision and how he executes in places that he shouldn't. You know, it's just how the hell does he pull that stuff off? How does he create SpaceX and actually get that to work? Mm-hmm. How does he build a company that doesn't make any money and get it worth billions of dollars? You know, so you kind of shake your head at that. Um, and then you see companies that have been around forever and how they sustain. You know, I think there's a great quote that came out, and I think Bezos said it uh, best recently, where it's like every great company ends at some point. You know, and, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to transcend those endpoints by continuing to evolve and change. And I think that's the same thing we look within our industry. Like you, you look at Bally's, which was a monster at one that's point. Right. Mm-hmm. And Don Wildman, who passed away last year and was a good friend. And I, you know, I, I think a living legend, um, you know, Don left and it went through an maturation of different leaders and eventually it succumbed and didn't make it. And so that, that thing went down and it got bought up by LA Fitness. And I think 24 bought some of his boxes and mm-hmm. amalgamated it. But at some point, you know, leadership, you know, and, and the way you finance a company and the way it's structured can lead to uh, success or failure. And you got to be really cautious about that. Mm-hmm. It, it's kind of like when we talked last time, I, I made a comment about Ray Wilson where I said, you know, Ray would constantly talk to me about bankruptcies because he'd been through so many. And I think people interpreted that I meant Ray personally when I didn't mean Ray personally at all. Ray had been in the industry since the 50s and so many gym chains that he competed with went under that he had to defend himself. Like when when Bally's goes bankrupt, God bless that company, it hurts us all because Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in rooms talking about Bally's. Why did it go bankrupt? What happened? What's going to stop you from right, going bankrupt? Right, Why sure. should I loan you money? Why should I buy you? You're constantly defending. And so Ray went through all these periods of so many companies he saw that went bankrupt. And I think people, even he, like they interpreted my words meaning that Ray went bankrupt. Ray never went bankrupt. Ray Ray survived. He's a survivor. And he's, you know, God bless him, at 91 right now, he's building a massive chain in Mexico. He's still getting after it. Wow, like, really? Damn. Really? Yeah, at 91? You, that's you, badass. You got to get him on yeah. your show one day. He would crack you guys up. Oh, he's, oh I would he's love amazing. to. I yeah, would he's, love to. He's, he's amazing. So Ray's built this massive company over and over again. And when we bought Family Fitness from him, it was the second largest gym chain in the country at the time. And we merged. We you know, we became the second because we, he was already there. Um, and then we grew it from there. And he sat on our board for a long time. He constantly sat there and tell me, you know, make sure you don't make these mistakes. Make sure you don't put too much leverage on your company. Make sure you do this, make sure you do that. He was always in my ear. And, you know, Ray, Ray built so many companies, I can't even keep track of them, but he's probably the most storied entrepreneur in our industry in the history of the fitness business. But you look at these living legends and you, you kind of look at him and, and Don Wildman and Rudy Smith and all these guys that are out there, they kind of paved the way for us. And then what changed the industry was monthly dues, right? Mm-hmm. We had a recurring revenue base. And you look at the global markets and some have that and some are all cash. Like China is all cash. If you oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's all cash. So they don't do they don't do the month to month EFT? No. So they're they're, you know, going through that period where club chains threes and fives and tens are not making it and they're crashing and burning because they aren't financed properly. And then others are kind of starting to get up there to fifty to seventy five to hundred. But you know, it's all cash every month you gotta start over. Where a lot of the other countries, you know, like if you go to Hong Kong, Singapore, you've got monthly dues because we built those programs. They weren't there till we got there. So if we'd been there, we, we would go to the country and, you know, sit with the banking institutions and put in place. Like we went to Santiago, Chile, they didn't have monthly dues. So we went and met the banking institutions. And after a year, we got them to buy off on it. We put it in place and we create electronic funds transfers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now, why why doesn't China do that? Is it because there's regulations around doing that or their banking system doesn't allow it? Part of that, but they don't have credit cards. You know, it's sure. a lot of debit cards. This is a different system there. And so a lot of people don't have that credit industry that we have here. It hasn't been built mm-hmm. to the level it's built here. That's and then, fascinating. And then the financing institutions don't have it yet. But it, it could be coming. I could be, you know, speaking out of tune or out of turn here because maybe in the last six months something's happened. Yeah. But uh, six months ago, my last visit still wasn't there. <laughs> it's funny because so many of our bills now are done electronically, just automatically deducted. The fitness industry kind of, I don't, I mean, pioneered it. I don't know if they were the first ones, but they definitely got people used to it. Yeah. You know, I would say that that's uh, it's probably gyms. That was the first member. The first thing I ever paid electronically was was a gym membership. Yeah, there's a company called Check Free that kind of started this. And and I think I told you when I first started in the business, I got invited to a seminar by Check Free. I went to it and they talked about taking money out of your checking account and your, your credit card to pay for things. And I just like I signed up immediately. 
and we put it in place. It took us years to kind of get consumers behind it, and they had a hard time with it. But Check Free was kind of the foundation. I, I remember Peter's the guy that ran it, and he sold it eventually for billions of dollars. I mean, he did a phenomenal job. But he's the kind of guy that pioneered all that and opened up that industry, and then the banking industry got in behind it. Mm. What do you think about, like, and I, there's a term for this. I don't know. What, I forget what it's called, where – it's, I see this more today than ever where you, you combine forces with like multiple companies or different things and, and wrap it all. In. And Amazon's a good example of this, right? You pay your Amazon Prime and you get all these other services built in with that. Have you thought about that in the fitness space? Like when we talk about nutrition and food delivery and it being like almost like this, hey, you get a membership and within the membership, you get all these other services. Have you thought about that? Yeah, we've done that. And, and you know, and we still kind of have that if you want it. But it's interesting that consumers, I think, are overwhelmed right now. Mm. I mean, a lot of times I sit with people, I say, let me see your phone. How many apps do you have on it? Right. Yeah. And you could turn like pages. There's mm-hmm. like 400 apps on a phone. And so I think that when you bring a one-stop shop, it's like, well, I like it, but I like this food service better. And I really like this gym app better. I like the Fit Plan app, but right. I don't like the Fit Star app. And you get into a little bit of that on there. But I think eventually, I, I've always felt that you need a trusted source. So let's say you guys become the trusted source. And you say, we're going to recommend. These are the five things you need to do. This is the best food service. This is the best workout app. This is the best gym. This is the best clothing. Lululemon, hold your butt up. It looks great. Wear that. Um, you know, whatever it is, you put those five things in and you're a trusted source. People will follow you. And then that kind of becomes the mantra because mm-hmm. a lot of times people look at, we put it out, they think, ah, oh, they're just trying to make money off us. And they don't buy into the fact that, well, we're just trying to push the ball up the court and let you guys have a chance to see what success can be like. Um, so it's a lot around being trusted and, and believed, believed in, I think. No, that's a, I mean, that's our model. That's exactly Mm -hmm. what we're trying Mm -hmm. to build is we are trying just, we try to provide so much value for our audience to create that, uh, create that for ourselves that we're now kind of an authority in the space that if we point people in a direction, like, Hey, try these guys out or go listen to this or go watch that. We have that. And then, then that in turn gives us the power and the ability to attract advertisers and marketing. Mm -hmm. That's uh, really interesting. So you, what do you see in, and I know we talk a lot about the gym industry with you because that's where that's all of our babies and what we're into, but I mean, you obviously are deep in the, uh, in the gaming, you're deep in building an NBA team. What, what parallels are you seeing in building an NBA team with building like a fitness team? Yeah, great question. Um, part, you know, you go through this period where you, you buy an NBA team, you got a bunch of owners in there, you've got a general partner who kind of has to make decisions because the NBA wants one general partner. And, and you're not always all on the same page. So it really boils down to the leader's vision of what they want to build. And I think part of like Vivek and I had a little bit of a difference of opinion in the early days. I felt we should go young and that we should build through the draft. And I think Vivek felt, felt like, I want to win now and I want to bring in some seasoned guys and get after it. And so which one was right or wrong? Who knows? He went down the season path. I like going down the draft path. We ended up now where we're in the draft path because we didn't we didn't win we didn't unfortunately perform well and so we ended up with some high draft picks and you know a couple of them didn't pan out but the last couple have I mean Darren Fox is a star in the making um, and he'll hopefully be a perennial All Star the guy's as fast as anybody I've ever seen play the game and then you've got uh, Marvin Bagley coming in and and Marvin is phenomenal at what he does you got young guys like Harry Giles that you know, we, we took who came off an ACL injury and we were patient, sat him his whole year. And if you've watched him play last night, every night, he's as athletic as anybody out there and he's going to be phenomenal. And then you got guys that can shoot the ball like Buddy Heald, who's one of the top three, you know, three point shooters in the NBA. So we've got a good nucleus of young kids on the bench and we're developing. And then, you know, we'll have another year to pick up a free agent or two and, and settle in. And you, know, you got Vladi Divac, who's been there, done that with Peja. So, you know, I think, I think that it just varies to, you know, the vision. And I think you have to hand it off. So I think Vivek's done a good job at saying, okay, I'm out of this. Vladi, it's your gig. And let's make it happen. And, and Vladi's working hard to kind of build our nucleus and kind of bring us back to what the Kings were in his era. And, um, you know, if you look at the, the personnel he's brought in, I think it looks pretty damn good for the future. Do you, have you been in it long enough now to where you see other organizations and you see things you can, you can point out like, just like you can the gym. We talked the gym, right? You sure. can walk in a gym and be like, they're missing here. They're missing there. Missing mm-hmm. there. Can you, do you feel like you've got that yet in the, in the NBA world, that landscape? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's a good question. I think you think that, right? <laughs> You're like, damn, I can figure this shit out. And then you get there and it's not so easy. It's a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of difficult around the small thing. It's like, it's like if you look at the Celtics as an example, I mean, they have all the talent in the world. People pick them to be the team this year, kind of rolling in. 
and they've struggled a little bit. And you saw them come in and crush the Warriors two nights ago. Then they came in last night and they, they beat us by two and we probably should have won the game. Um, but what they said was, as an example, they had a long flight out to play the Warriors and that five, six hour plane ride got them a little bit tighter and they went to the game and they played really well. And what you see is that the NBA player today, that camaraderie you need, that team kind of feel, isn't as what it used to be because mm. you know so much going on with social media. Uh, a lot of kids are busy with their other things going on in life and um, the, the things they're trying to do off the court that they're not as tight as they once were. Mm. And it's just a different kind of mindset you have to have to really play at a high level. So I think the teams that are hungry and that haven't had success, that have been slighted, like the Milwaukee Bucks, no one thinks the Bucks are good. They got Giannis, they got the Greek freak. Those guys are pissed off and they're hungry. They play hard every night and they want to win. And the Warriors have been there, done that. And can they turn it on? They probably say, yeah, we can turn on any time. Yeah. I don't know if it's that easy, but we'll see. So you sit back and you think you know all these things, but it's so hard, it's so complicated, it's so difficult that you're just glad you got somebody like Vladi Divac who's doing it all because you don't want to deal with it. Oh, I was just going to ask you, easy. I can't imagine with the, all these things you have your hands in, like how do you how do you organize your mind? Like yeah. where, where, where is your energy at? Is it, are you more focused on one business more than the other right now? Like how do you disperse your time? Yeah, no, good question. I, th I think that you have great teams in all your businesses and you're just available if they need you. And some teams need more of you right now in different periods of time than others. So if you look at the crunch team, they've got two phenomenal leaders in Ben Midgley and Keith Wirtz. And then Jim Rowley oversees that. And I, I don't have to spend a lot of time. Those guys are the best at the best. I mean, Jim's been my partner forever and he ran half of 24. So ex-Marine, you yeah. don't get in his way. He just gets it done. Yeah, I, I remember sitting yeah. down with Jim Rowley one day. And this was when they actually had uh, rolled out the fitness game binder. And I had found, I didn't know that he was behind it and creating it. And <laughs> it was him, it was him, Adam, it was him, Derek Gallup and Adam Sedlak. And I think we were sitting me down. And at that time I was one of the top performing fitness managers and they wanted to come in and talk to me about what I thought about the fitness game plan binder that I never fucking filled out. <laughs> and uh, and I said to him, he, he asked me, what do you think about the, the, the binder? And I go, um, well, do you want the answer that I'm supposed to say to you or do you want the truth? He said, no, no, I want to know your truth. And I said, well, uh, it's it's really not for me. I said, I, uh, I've been doing this for a really long time. And if anything, I feel like what's what I'm having to I'm having to report to my DM all the time. And I find myself uh, more stressed out about making sure I filled out my fitness game planner than getting out and touching my members and touching my trainers and doing what I do best. Uh, so I could see value in it for somebody who's brand new. Uh, but personally, I think it sucks. <laughs> I didn't know that he was <laughs> the, the man behind it at that time. And I don't know how he took that. I still, to this day, don't know if he respected me more for that or he fucking didn't like me. Because of that. <laughs> <laughs> knowing Jimmy respected you more for it. Okay. Knowing him. Good. I hope so. Yeah. But yeah, but, but I think yeah, you get into the leadership. So like you mentioned, couple names there. So if you take a look at UFC, so Adam's the president overseeing that. Mike Apple's in there. You remember Mike? Yeah. He's, oh, yeah. he's run domestic franchise. Derek Galp's in there running the fitness. You know, Derek was a, the uh, chairman of Versa for the last couple of years. And then you got a great team around those guys, Tamar Ogundi, who came over to us out of the Gold uh, International Groups running international. So they got killer guys there. So I help where I need to help. And and they've got good, good people in finance, Mike Pilatus and then Sean Pence runs, you know, legal and everything there. So they have a really great team there that executes. And then, you know, you look at uh, the Kings, you know, you got a great team there. You got uh, young guys are playing hard every night that want to prove themselves and they're hungry and they want that respect from their peers. And then you've got a, a, a group of guys up top like Vladi and Peja who are very, very focused on, you know, making us relevant again in, in the near term. And it was nice to see Brad Stevens, the coach to Boston, said some really good words about us. You know, before the game last night, he, he talked about, hey, looking at the team and how young they're, how they're playing. He goes, this is a tough place to play. Everybody in the league's talking about it. it's hard to get a win here. Mm. Hopefully we'll get a win tonight. But these guys are really good. And they spank the Warriors by 35. And they come in, they, they squeak one out from us from two. So, you know, we played the Warriors four times this year. I think we set an NBA record four times. The total points were, we lost all four by a total of 12 points. No four games between any two teams has been that close before ever. So we're, we're getting better. But I think every business has, you have to have great leaders. 
You have to have faith in those leaders. You have to let them run. You got to be there to support them. You just want to keep the guardrails there so they don't go too far off. You say that mm. so so easily, mm-hmm. but I I really this is one of the things that I think I've I've always respected you so much for, and that I think it's a very rare trait to find. And you we just threw out a bunch of names that obviously a lot of listeners probably have no clue who they all are. I know who most of them are, and most of them have been close to you for a very long time, and that speaks volumes about you as a leader that you have this ability to go into other spaces, other businesses, and then you've been able to, to attract these in brilliant, intelligent, incredible leaders themselves to follow you almost anywhere. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, it's, I've been able to talk to a lot of people over the years. I think part of it is that you know I let people fail and succeed on their own terms, and I'm just there to support them. You know, I'll, I'll constantly give them advice. And I used to always say that, look, I'll tell you a couple of times. And if you fail each time, then the third time, I'll probably be a little bit harder on you. But if you're right and I'm wrong, you get a little bit more rope. And I, I think that you find good people. And my dad used to always say that, you know, one of the keys to success in leaders is being able to choose good people. Not even find them, but just choose them. And so a lot of times you get into organizations and you see people. Like I, I remember when I, I went down and started working with the UFC group, I saw this gal I met. Her name's uh, Britta Phelps. And I spent a little bit of time with her and I said, come here, you're, I'm moving you. And I moved her over into a role, into another role. And now she's kind of leading a bunch of stuff down there. Super smart. Uh, went to law school. Great story. She took her, her bar exam the first two days, crushed it. The third day, she got everything done on her computer, went to turn it in, and her computer crashed, just blew up. And she went, the bar, the bar group says, well, we need your stuff. You got to go fix it. So she went to like an encryption place. They couldn't recover it. So she got pissed off and said, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be a lawyer. And so she went off and worked for an NFL agency group that manages a bunch of players. And then we picked her up and now she's making a ton of dough, running a ton of things and helping all over the place. And she's as bright as anybody I've ever met, but she's just sitting there making a little bit of money kind of in the corner. And I'm like, you know, spend an hour with her and right away I could see she's super bright, super intelligent, super passionate. Everybody touches her is just amazed. So it's like you guys, right? You get together and you find the right cadence and you find the fact that you're all very bright and very passionate and you work together well and you form a team and you get rolling. And I, I just believe that you just meet people and sometimes you put them in the right place to succeed. You give them runway to get after it and learn and fail and they appreciate that and then they know you got your back. Pay them well, support them well. They want to take a couple of days off. Who cares? Take it off. There's no big deal. Whatever you need, I'm here for. And then you know when I really need you, and I call, generally you're there and you're on it and you produce and it's like all good. Awesome. Yeah, from the outside, you look like you've succeeded at everything you've ever tried. Uh, but but I'm sure that's not true, right? I'm sure you've had some some hard failures along the way. What were some of the most difficult ones for you? What were some of the, the, the biggest turning points in terms of misses? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer because I don't look back like, hey, I screwed up, what, what can mm-hmm. I do? But I, I do evaluate a lot like, okay, what could I have done better there? You know, there's been some places we've entered in markets where it just didn't work. Like we went into Korea, we performed really well. We made a lot of money, did, did great there, but it is a very tough cultural mix between the, the folks there and our team. We just couldn't get it right. So we decided to bail out of Korea and just sold the business and moved on. Just didn't work right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just wasn't good for us. And then in life, sometimes it really isn't necessarily the businesses that fail. I can't point to too many businesses. I go back and say, shit, man, that thing was a mess. I didn't do it right. I think most of them are pretty good. It's really people. And a lot of times it's the, the change of guard. So like at 24, as an example, we had a phenomenal company just rolling and we had a change of the guard. You know, the, the early investors wanted to get out. I'm willing to roll with any new buyer. One crazy guy shows up and says, no, I don't need you. I can run it without you. And you basically say, okay, well, it's your business. You know, I'm shocked, but what the hell? Go ahead. He buys the business and then he changes the guard and the guard comes in and it, it's just like you brought um, Trump in, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and he's just going to change everything, not knowing what the hell he's doing, just wing it, hoping that his personality will su- survive. And it doesn't really work with everybody. And he upsets the apple cart and the business goes into kind of a little bit of shock for a while until it reemerges into whatever it's going to be. So to me, it's really people. And if you have the consistency of people in relationship, you generally can work through everything. If you have good people that are willing to work with you and listen. But if you have a change, you just never know what you're going to get. And that's when I think it really gets hard. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you have certain guys that like you call for a certain thing? Like, for example, like you got a, you got a headache going on in the NBA side of your house and it's like, 
I think this is the move, but I have my guy that I'm going to call and run that by. And then you have one for your, do you have one for each kind of space that you're in? Yeah. Good question. I, yes. To a certain extent, a lot of times just, I'll go home and bitch to my wife, you know, if she'll listen to me, <laughs> she might put her pods in and I won't get anything in, but, but um, yeah, there's, there's guys in the NBA I trust. I really respect and I can pick up the phone and call and say, what do you hear? What do you think? And they'll give you good advice, honest advice. And they've proven to do that over and over again. I've got relationships with, with former players and and uh, guys I trust, and I, I can reach out and talk to, and they'll give me feedback. In the business world, in our industry, yeah, at times there's people you can definitely call and say, hey, what do you think and what do you recommend? Um, and there's board of directors type level folks you can get into and talk to. But a lot of times, you know, it's kind of a little bit of fake news. It's like I was watching yesterday, they were talking about Tyler Murray maybe going first in the NFL draft. And then some guy came out who said that he had heard through two general managers that, you know, he didn't test well, he's aloof, and that he didn't do the X and O's wells at the combine. And my immediate reaction was that whoever told him that was full of shit and wanted his draft stock to go down so they could probably pick him. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right. Because there's just no way uh-huh. that yeah. kid is that kid, right? Yeah. It's just not possible. Yeah. <laughs> and he's the Heisman Trophy winner. He's phenomenal. The A's gave him a first round pick and everywhere you've ever heard him talk, he's intelligent as hell. So you knew that was just a bunch of shit. So sometimes you got to be really careful who you talk to too because right. you don't always get the the right answers. That's you have true. to listen to your you know inner compass on what you really believe. But, you know, if you're looking for a yes, you'll always find that yes. A lot of times I'm looking for the no's. Right. So mm-hmm. someone says, hey, you know, I, I've had a long-term partner, Leonard Schlem, who's as brilliant as they come. He's another guy you should have on the show one day. He's freaking brilliant, phenomenal. He's been with me since the, the 80s, and he runs a bunch of businesses up in, in Canada now, but he's been around the health and fitness industry forever. He's a very solid compass. At any time you talk to him, he's very grounded. Harvard MBA in finance, super smart. And he just tells you like it is. He doesn't hold back. That's the people I feel like I reach out to. I, mm-hmm. I rarely seek out somebody who I think is going to agree. I'm like, mm-hmm. I want the guy who's definitely going to argue with me because then that will make me think about it more, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. Are there any uh, investment opportunities that have been presented to you that you regret now as far as like, or just have like a fear of missing out in terms of it like blowing up and, and it was presented right to you and you just let it go? A good question. I mean, I could have got into Peloton early on, and that thing's crushing it now. Here, it's going to come out about an eight billion dollar valuation. Ooh, they really? Yeah. Woo, holy yeah, cow! So they're killing it. Um, I did something instead that hopefully does the same. So I don't feel as bad. <laughs> um, but they're doing good work. I really, I really uh, thought maybe you know was that worth investing at the time? It was a big valuation at the time, so it wasn't early. Um, in the fitness space and health and wellness, I mean, there's so much stuff that's flown by. We've kind of gotten into some of the good ones. I'd say some haven't kind of gone to the level I'd like to see them get to, but nothing I'm super disappointed about that I would say, you know, should I or shouldn't I have done it? Because it's just time management, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, definitely writing a check's nice. You don't have to do anything. You know, you put money in. Hey, here you go. Here's X dollars and come back when you sell it. And hopefully you made a ton of money and I do well too. But the ones you have to put your sleeves up on, the key is can you help drive that thing to X plus Y or, or is it going to go X plus Z? Mm-hmm. And it, that's really kind of where it boils down to. There's stuff I wish I hadn't done at times where I said, look, that was a lot more energy and effort than mm. it was worth. And I see those, I go back and like, eh, I probably shouldn't have done that, put too mm-hmm. much energy in that. You know, sometimes my wife says I, I put too much energy into my kids' sports. You know, she's like, just peel back a little bit there. But I'm all in one of those guys. If my son says I want to do this, I'm all in for him. Right. My daughter says I want to do that, I'm all in for her. My wife says sometimes I should peel back a little bit. But, you know, really it's around moving forward. And I think I've enjoyed the ride and I've enjoyed the the fun, the camaraderie uh, that we've had. You know, the the difficulty now is, is uh, you know, what's next, as you guys were talking earlier, what's mm. really coming next? And I've kind of tried to slow down, not do too much, just kind of, you know, wind down what we have and kind of grind it out and, and bring some success. And I think you'll see some things hit the, the press in the next uh, few months that you'll smile at. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, as, as you go forward, you know, the probably the, the big one you look at is 24 because we, our whole team was prepared to stay with the buyer and somebody came in and just decided to, pick up the tablecloth and try and whip it and have all the plates stay on the table. And unfortunately they just don't, they don't stay. Mm. Mm. So in terms of the process of like evaluating some of these investment opportunities, do you have kind of like a checklist and like where you're at in life and like how much time you actually have that you can devote to these things? Yeah, for sure. I get calls all the time. Like I want you to do this, help us with that. And I'm like, you know, guys, it's how much time are you looking for? Mm. <laughs> we want four board meetings a year, a call every month. You have to fly here. 
uh, okay, well, what, what do you want me to do for that? You know, what are you going to give me? And how's it work? And you can, well, we'll give you 1% of the company. Like, well, what's your company going to be worth one day? We hope $100 million. I said, okay, well, a million dollars is nice, but unfortunately for me, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the premise you get there, which is probably not going to happen. And then I'm not going to give you all this time and energy. It's mm-hmm. just not going to work. So I'd say most stuff I just say no to. I don't sit mm-hmm. really on any boards. I just have fun with my family and spend time doing this with you guys and hang out a little bit with the businesses and just stay very focused. And as Alex and Rodriguez and I talk all the time, I I'm really believe in, in narrow and deep versus shallow and wide. I just don't want to be in a hundred things on a surface level. I'd rather be in three or four things, get really deep and really after it and do it extremely well and be proud about it. Mm. So I don't sprinkle. I'm just not a guy that puts sprinkles on top of the cake. No, that's yeah. I, I just posted a quote and I'm going to massacre it because I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how it went. But the the, the idea of it is that they, the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no to most of everything mm-hmm. and have that ability to do that like you just did. So I think that's so important. Man, I tell you, Mark, I really appreciate you coming down. We always have such a good time hanging out and yeah, talking to you, man. Love it. Love having it. Yeah. Uh, time with you guys again and love being here. Keep rocking. <laughs> so will. I'll keep shouting your name and you, yeah. know, you guys will be, uh, you know, I'll be a little fish in a frying pan one day and you guys are just launching all over the world. Uh, <laughs> awesome. I hope so. It's fun to watch your success. Keep going. Awesome. Oh, I, 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 we, going. we appreciate it. And you got yeah. a megaphone here if you ever want to use it. So. I appreciate 100%. that. Right. Thank you very appreciate much. That. Right, man. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.